She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time, which, as you can probably see, has recently turned into a hot chocolate and crime time because I've been entirely over-caffeinated lately and I'm trying to cut back, not forever, just for the short term, like, you know, a month or so because, whew! got the shakes. So today we are going over a case that I feel definitely needs more exposure. I'm so glad that I happened to find out about it because I really think getting more eyes on this case, it might help bring some answers to a family who desperately wants them and who deserve to know what happened to a person that clearly was and still is highly valued and fiercely loved. I happened upon this case by chance. Luckily, People Magazine did a quick story about it, which led me to other articles, which led me to a bunch of other information. But before we jump into the case, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service built by those who know what makes a gripping true story come to life, documentary filmmakers. They believe that television should both entertain and enlighten. I believe that as well. And that's why Magellan TV has searched the globe for films and series that have the most dramatic imagery, the most cutting edge subjects, and the most authentic insights from the world's top historians, scientists, and explorers. I was just watching a documentary when I was putting on my makeup and getting ready to come down and record today, and I thought to myself as I was watching, like, I just wish I could keep doing this kind of. I just wish I could transfer this, what I'm watching on Magellan TV, to my TV, which you can, you can, but instead of going down to record a video, I just want to sit on the couch and watch documentaries all day, and nothing makes that easier to do than Magellan TV because they have over 3,000 titles, and they add more every single week. I know many of you have already signed up for Magellan TV and you've been enjoying and watching the massive amount of amazing documentary films and series that they have available and I would like to recommend something for you that I watched and enjoyed greatly as a fan of, you know, true crime mystery and Agatha Christie, the late and great mystery novelist. Now I don't know if this is true. I think it is because on agathachristie.com it claims that she is the best-selling author of all time. She's only outsold by the Bible and Shakespeare, which is crazy. And this woman was an amazing writer, and she lived an interesting life. And that is why today I am encouraging you to go and watch Agatha Christie Code. What makes Agatha Christie such a successful writer? Well, the makers of this documentary attempted to answer this question on the 75th anniversary of Christie's immortal character, Miss Marple. In this documentary, they use sophisticated computer analysis of Christie's every written word, her sentence structure, story arcs, poisons used, red herrings, clues, and more. It's so good. As a fan of mystery, but especially as a writer myself, I loved this documentary, and I don't want to give anything away. Like, it's so cool. I don't want to give anything away. So go check it out. Magellan TV has content about history, true crime, science, nature, travel, and really anything else that you're interested in. And everything streams to you ad-free, whether you're watching in your cell phone, laptop, your tablet, or from your smart TV, Roku, Apple TV, etc. Like I said, they have over 3,000 documentary films and series. They add more every single week. So if you're interested in checking Magellan TV out for yourself, Click the link in the description box and start watching for free for one month. After that one month, you can continue with Magellan TV or cancel at any time. No questions asked and no strings attached. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. So it's always hard for me to refer to the people we talk about in these videos as victims because, you know, they didn't choose to be victims. They didn't live as victims in their lives. Somebody else decided that they were going to become a victim. 
And the people we talk about in these cases, in these videos, they are so much more than, you know, how they died. Alicia Monet Jackson was no exception. She was a very special person. Born on May 7th, 1985 in North Carolina and raised in Kentucky, Alicia moved with her family to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania when she was 15 years old and began attending Central Dauphin East High School. When she first arrived in Harrisburg, Alicia didn't know anyone, but it didn't take long for her to become very popular and very well-liked. Alicia's father, Kevin, who is a minister, he said that from the time Alicia was born, she had, quote, a delightful manner about herself. And Alicia was always playing the role of peacemaker amongst her family and friends because it was important to her that everyone get along and that everyone felt safe and loved. Alicia excelled at math, she loved to read, she played the piano and violin from a young age, and she had a beautiful singing voice. Two things that were incredibly important to Alicia were her family and her faith, and she rarely missed church. In high school, Alicia was a natural-born leader, and people gravitated towards her. She started a step dance program at her school. She was on the honor roll. She participated in concert band and choir. She was voted homecoming queen her senior year, and she even played softball, although she wasn't that good at it. But according to her family, Alicia never quit anything, even if it didn't come naturally to her. Alicia's cousin and best friend, Shantae, said, quote, She was very tenacious and outgoing. I always wanted to be Alicia. For the looks, the books, the people skills, I looked up to her. They say no one is perfect, and obviously I'm not saying she was perfect, but as close to perfection as you can get, she was. End quote. After high school, Alicia moved to Columbus, Ohio, where she began attending Ohio State University, going on to get her bachelor's degree in architecture and later her master's degree in city and regional planning. It was at Ohio State that Alicia met close friend Autumn Williams, who remembered that Alicia was always trying to inspire and uplift her friends with positive messages of love and support. One of the last things that Alicia said to Autumn was in the form of an encouraging email telling her that iron shapes iron. It's actually a proverb, and the full version is, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Basically meaning, you know, two heads are better than one. According to the Bible Knowledge Commentary, when iron is rubbed against another piece of iron, it shapes and sharpens it. Similarly, people can help each other improve by their discussions, criticisms, suggestions, and ideas. Two friends who bring their ideas together can help each other become sharper. And I love this. It's a great message. It seemed that this was who Alicia really was, and it was what she put out into the world. She wanted to see others succeed. She wanted to see the lives of those around her become better and more enriched, and she knew that a rising tide lifts all boats, in the words of the late and great JFK. And that is truly unique, right? In a world where everyone is worried about themselves and many have no problem holding others back if it benefits their own progress, it was a unique way to be. It's the way that you know we all should be. It was also at Ohio State that Alicia met fellow student Eugene Wilson, who she fell in love with, and who she would later become engaged to. According to her family, Alicia and Eugene had a good relationship, and Alicia's father, Kevin, said, quote, He was on track as far as academics, and he came from a godly family. These are all positive things. Of course, I still gave him 50 questions when I first met him, end quote. And you know, these are all important things when you're getting into a relationship that's going to turn into marriage. Eugene and Alicia were both concerned about their education, getting an education, getting higher education, doing something good, putting that out into the world. And they also both came from families that felt God and faith were very important, and they would go on to most likely raise their own children with those same values, you know, an education education, faith, family. Like they were happy. So I didn't, at that time I was young also. So from what I knew love was at that time, it was love to me. So I didn't think or have any second guessing like this wasn't a right situation. 
As Alicia and Eugene began spending more time together, they also began spending more time with each other's families, and Alicia would become very close to Eugene's mother, Sarah Wilson. But when Alicia found out that she was pregnant, she was excited, but obviously also nervous, as was her boyfriend Eugene. They both knew that becoming parents while they were simultaneously striving for their graduate degrees would be challenging, but of course they saw their child as a blessing. On July 29, 2008, their son Jeremiah came into the world and Alicia was introduced to the love of her life. Jeremiah, or Juju, as Alicia affectionately called him, was everything to his mother. And Erica Wicks, a friend of Alicia's from Ohio State, said that motherhood made Alicia even better. Alicia loved bringing Jeremiah to church every Sunday dressed in the Ohio State colors of scarlet and gray, and she celebrated everything that he did with pure joy. Alicia's cousin Shantae said, quote, She was so excited when Juju was hitting his milestones. You could tell the excitement. Oh, Juju started this. You could feel the love, end quote. Now, Alicia and Eugene planned on getting married as soon as Eugene completed his graduate studies. And in the meantime, Alicia began working as a research associate for Community Research Partners on East Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio. This was a nonprofit that worked in partnership with the city to transform raw data into invaluable information that would help guide future community decision making. Alicia, Eugene, and Jeremiah lived in a two-bedroom townhome at 4144 Helen Rose Lane. And while Eugene continued with his master's studies, Alicia fell into a comfortable life, working and caring for her family. Alicia was very active. She had recently run a half marathon, and she was also preparing for Christmas, which was a holiday that she loved. Alicia had become a very good cook, and her family raved about her lasagna. But when the holiday season came around, she busied herself with baking cookies and planning a trip back to Pennsylvania with Jeremiah to see her family for Christmas. Now, there were some changes coming up in Alicia's life. In the previous fall, when she had attended her cousin Shantae's wedding in September, Alicia had announced that she and her little family were going to be moving to Dallas, Texas. Shantae said that Eugene had already gotten a job in Dallas, and Alicia had started networking in the area to also find employment. It was definitely going to be an adjustment, but Alicia was facing it head-on, as she did everything in her life. But the bright and ambitious 25-year-old would never have the chance to see what this new chapter in her life held. Because on December 2, 2010, the day after Alicia texted her cousin Shantae out of the blue to tell her that she loved her, Alicia was brutally stabbed to death in her own home in front of her beloved two-year-old son, Jeremiah. Alicia had left work a few minutes early that day. She was really concerned that she didn't have enough eggs at home, and she told her coworkers that she needed to run to the store to pick up a dozen eggs. When she picked Jeremiah up from his babysitters, Alicia mentioned once again to the babysitter that she and Jeremiah were stopping at the store before going home. Now, it appears that Alicia and Jeremiah arrived home to their townhouse in the Strawberry Farms neighborhood at around 5.30 p.m., at which point Alicia settled Jeremiah into his high chair in the living room and turned on the television so he could watch cartoons while she began to prepare dinner. The way it seems to be explained in articles and things is Jeremiah's high chair was sort of centrally located in a place where he could both watch the TV so he could watch his cartoons so she could get the meal on, but he could also see his mother at all times. Because, you know, Alicia and Jeremiah were very close. She was very responsive to his needs. She wasn't the type of mother who would sort of ever make her child feel unsafe or uncomfortable. At 5.53 p.m., Alicia's mother sent her a text asking her how she was doing. And Alicia responded, quote, fine, how are you? End quote. Three minutes later, Alicia's mother replied, but she received no text back. At 9 p.m., Alicia's fiancé and Jeremiah's father arrived home after meeting with some fellow Ohio State students, and he walked into a horrific scene. There was blood everywhere, on the front door, the back door, in the bathroom, on the walls, the ceilings, and specifically in the living room, where Eugene found Alicia on the couch, stabbed 30 times to her neck, her chest, and her face. 
Two-year-old Jeremiah was still sitting in his high chair in the same room, unharmed, but apparently he was also the only witness to his mother's brutal murder. A frantic Eugene immediately picked up the phone and dialed 911, begging for an ambulance to be sent, but Alicia Monet Jackson was pronounced dead on the scene. Besides the massive amount of blood everywhere, Alicia's townhouse seemed to be the scene of a normal, cozy night at home. It appeared that Alicia had started preparing dinner when she and Jeremiah arrived home. She must have settled Jeremiah into his high chair and then walked into the kitchen where she put together a meatloaf, popped it into the oven, pulled out a pot, filled it with water, and put the pot on the stove to boil. When authorities arrived on the scene at 9.20 p.m., the meatloaf was still in the oven and the pot of water was still boiling away on the hot stove. There were also bills and paperwork on the coffee table in the living room where Jeremiah was watching cartoons. So I can imagine that once she put the pot of water on the stove, Alicia went into the living room to wait for it to boil and started going through and paying bills. Law enforcement believes that whoever killed Alicia was known to her and that she felt safe enough with them to open the door to her home while her precious two-year-old son was inside and invite this person in. Columbus Police Department Detective James Porter said, quote, It looks like she probably knew whoever it was, somebody who had a conflict with her of some kind, end quote. Alicia's younger brother, Traven, agrees with this sentiment, but he believes that if someone had a problem with his sister or bad intentions toward her, this person had kept their feelings secret from Alicia. Traven said that Alicia was very cautious and it would be, quote, very unlikely for her to see somebody at the door that she doesn't know and let them in the house with her toddler son while feeding him. There is 0% chance that would happen. This was 100% personal. This was a feeling that was unbeknownst to my sister, that this person really felt this way until this person took her life, end quote. There was no sign of forced entry, and the officials ruled out burglary as a motive because there was only a few specific items removed from Alicia's townhouse. The only things taken were two of Alicia's laptop computers, with their power cords left plugged into the wall, and Alicia's cell phone. Her purse and wallet were untouched and left by the front door where she had put them when she'd come home that evening. Whoever had knocked on Alicia's door had clearly not been a concern to her, and she hadn't viewed them as a threat. For the next eight days, investigators worked, methodically collecting every piece of evidence at the crime scene, every scrap of fabric, every piece of paper, every shoe print inside or outside the home. Now, the neighbors, some of them weren't home at this time, and nobody reported hearing the murder happen. Nobody reported hearing screaming or signs of a struggle or sounds of a struggle, and there were no security cameras in the complex at this time. So Alicia's killer was not caught on camera. Due to the amount of blood around the apartment, including in the bathroom, it was clear that Alicia's murderer had moved about the townhouse after committing their violent crime, and they must have been cleaning themselves up before leaving out the back door where there was blood found on the door and the back stoop. Police brought in tracking dogs, and these tracking dogs picked up the scent of an unknown person and followed the path of this person who had allegedly left the building and headed away from the building towards the north side. But the dogs eventually lost this trail, most likely due to the fresh snow that was falling. A discarded rubber glove was found on nearby Silver Rod Lane, and that was also taken into evidence. And nearby garbage cans were searched. And when they're searching for garbage cans at this point, they're searching for anything that the attacker may have discarded, such as bloody clothing or a disguise. Say the person leaves the building on foot and they're wearing a black shirt and like a black hat. If any witnesses saw this person, they're going to say to the police, oh, well, this person was leaving the building wearing a black shirt and a black hat. So the person might take that hat off, throw it in the garbage, put a different hat on, etc., or even throw the murder weapon away. In cases that are sort of random attacks of violence, like burglaries and things, you'll often see this. But nothing more substantial was found, including the murder weapon, which has not been found to this day. And it really hasn't ever been identified, at least as far as we know. The police may know what type of weapon this was, how long the blade was. Was it a kitchen knife? Was it a different kind of knife? They may know this, but we don't know. 
At this point, that leads us with the only witness to Alicia's death being a two-year-old little boy who was understandably distraught by the horror he had just been forced to witness. Detective Stephen Eppert, who was at the townhome that night, he claims it was the worst crime scene he's ever seen, the kind he still sees when he closes his eyes. And he said, quote, I don't know what a two-year-old is capable of seeing and remembering, but I sure wish I could have asked that child who hurt his mommy, end quote. Now, at this time, Jeremiah's relatives had not wanted him questioned by law enforcement, obviously because he was so traumatized. I can't really blame them for this. And uh, Detective Appert says he understands this line of thought, but he still wishes that he knew if the two-year-old could have provided something of value at that point. And I mean, if you've been watching me for a while, you guys know how I feel about children. You guys know how I feel about the parent-child relationship, how... Uh, very truly important it is, how very truly innocent children are, and how they should be allowed to remain innocent for as long as possible because it, it ends too quickly. Childhood and that innocence ends too quickly more so now, today, than, than ever before. Well, that's a lie. I mean, back in the day, right? They had kids working in factories. So I take it back. I take it back. I've changed my opinion. But still, you know what I mean. And this case reminded me so much when I was first going through it, the case of Krista Worthington, who was similarly murdered in front of her very young daughter in Cape Cod. And I will link that case in the description box. It's in two parts. But it was it was a very crazy case. And I actually went to Cape Cod and went to the house where it happened because I was just so intrigued by what was going on with this case because Cape Cod's a very insular, small community. And I definitely think that somebody there, maybe more than one person there, knows exactly what happened to Krista. But they won't come forward because she wasn't super well-liked in, in her community. She was sort of considered an outsider. So I'm going to link that case in the description box if you're interested in um, kind of checking that one out. And obviously, it also depends on the two-year-old. We're not sure how verbal Jeremiah was at this time. Was he two, closer to three? Had he just turned two? The speech capabilities of a child at this young age are hit or miss. And considering what he saw, he may not have been even able to verbalize it, even if he could um, verbalize it, you know, even if his age made him capable of verbalizing it. He may have been so much in shock because a, a little baby's brain isn't isn't ready to handle something like that. Um, so he may have been in too much shock to even say anything. So unfortunately, you know, if he did have something, the time for him to have said what he saw would have passed. And most likely at this point, I hope to God that it would have become a suppressed memory and that he still is not remembering or having like thoughts or, you know, glimpses of memory about this. So when a terrible murder like this happens, people, of course, are going to immediately and initially look to the, the victim's significant other as a possible suspect. And the stats back this up, right? From 1980 to 2008, nearly one out of every five victims were killed by an intimate partner. And research shows that women are more likely to be killed at the hands of a boyfriend, husband, or even a same-sex partner than by anyone else. Alicia's fiancé, Eugene, did cooperate fully with authorities, and his whereabouts at the time of the murder were accounted for. Now, remember, at this time, Eugene was finishing up his master's degree, and he was still attending classes at Ohio State. He was at classes that day, and apparently after classes, he had some meetings with other students, which I assume were study groups of sorts. Although the police do not believe that Eugene was responsible for Alicia's murder, Detective Stephen Eppert told the Columbus Dispatch in 2012 that he believed Alicia's killer was a woman from Eugene's past, possibly an angry ex-girlfriend. Eppert said that the assault was so brutal and Alicia's wounds were so significant that her killer had to have been fueled by uncontrollable anger. Eppert said, quote, who has that motive? Who has that much of a personal vendetta against our victim? It's personal rage. It's jealousy, end quote. Eppert also believes the number of stab wounds, specifically to Alicia's face, was more about disfigurement than anything else. Obviously, 30 stab wounds to one person is 
the definition of overkill. You don't need to stab someone that many times to kill them if that is your only goal, to kill them. I found this very interesting paper online, which was titled Patterns of Injury in Homicide Relationships, and it was written by a graduate student, Shay alvarez Cusson, and she did this using data from the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. And in her paper, she says, quote, Interestingly, excessive wounding beyond that which is necessary to cause death was observed more than expected in both acquaintance and intimate homicides, end quote. The paper goes on to say that when overkill is present, the offender is less likely to be a stranger and more likely to be known to the victim. Remember that Alicia sustained stab wounds to her face, her neck, and her chest, and this is often seen in cases where the victim is being depersonalized by their attacker. The paper says, quote, The presence of extreme facial injury and homicide is not only a manifestation of deep-seated and often long-standing anger by the offender against the victim, but also an attempt to depersonalize him or her. The facial battery indicates an attempt to strip the victim of actual identity, end quote. Now, keep in mind, in this case, no suspects or persons of interest have ever been named. But Alicia and Eugene, they did go through a hard time in their relationship about two years before her murder. While Alicia was pregnant with Jeremiah, she found out that Eugene had been unfaithful to her. And he had gotten another woman pregnant. And this woman allegedly gave birth to her child just a few months after Jeremiah was born. Alicia's family members have commented on this, with her father, Kevin, saying, quote, I know that hurt Alicia substantially because that means he was having another relationship probably while she was pregnant, end quote. There was a rough patch, but she did ultimately decide to get through that and she decided to move forward. Eugene and Alicia dealt with their issues. They resolved this between themselves and maybe their planned move to Texas was an attempt to start fresh somewhere new where there wasn't as much baggage. But based on certain aspects of the crime, including the security that Alicia clearly felt allowing her attacker inside and the shallow nature of some of her stab wounds, law enforcement seems to believe that she may have been killed by another woman and that she was not expecting this attack. Retired Detective Stephen Eppert said the struggle began and ended by the couch, and it seemed as if Alicia was attacked from behind as she was possibly walking the person into her living room. So imagine, you know, someone knocks at your door, you answer it, it's somebody that you know, somebody that you, you know, in some ways trust, somebody that's probably been in your home before, so it's not weird that they're there. So you say, hey, what are you doing here? And the person's like, oh, you know, I stopped by. I wanted to see Juju or just wanted to chat, maybe have a cup of coffee, you know, hang out. And so Alicia's like, hey, come in. So the person walks in. Alicia closes the door. Alicia turns around, walks her guest, who she thinks is her guest, into the living room, gets in the living room. Uh, It seemed as if maybe she was like making space for the person to sit down on the couch and then she's attacked from behind. Several news articles have reported that several friends and relatives of Alicia's have taken and passed lie detector tests, but others have refused. And there was DNA testing done on evidence from the townhouse, but it doesn't seem as if this evidence has been retested with the advent of new technology, such as touch DNA, which as as most of you know, because we've talked about this before, touch DNA is based on skin cells rather than blood. All the blood found in the townhouse reportedly belonged to Alicia Jackson. So whoever attacked her didn't leave their own blood behind. But if her attacker touched something without gloves on, their skin cells might be waiting on a swab in storage at this very moment. And if those samples were retested with new technology, new DNA technology, maybe... Alicia's attacker's days of freedoms might be numbered. It's suspected that whoever killed Alicia obviously would have had quite a bit of blood on them, but then they went into the bathroom to clean up. Why else would Alicia's blood have been found in the bathroom? So if this person was wearing gloves, which it's believed that they probably were, if this person was wearing gloves, you'd think they'd take the gloves off in order to, you know, wash their hands. So maybe they left skin cells on the sink somewhere, on the faucet, anything that could just be now retested with new technology and and lead to somewhere. Alicia's cousin Shantae said, quote, We're not going to find that knife. We aren't going to find Alicia's laptop and phone that were taken from her townhouse that night. We're not going to get a confession at this point. 
Word of mouth is all we have. It's one thing to pass away. It's another thing to pass away young. It's another thing to be killed. But it's another thing to be stabbed in the way that she was stabbed and then to ice the cake stabbed in front of her most prized possessions. When Alicia was killed, her younger brother Trevin lost one of his biggest supporters. And I wanted to call her, I wanted to text her, and I expected her, I, I almost subconsciously expected her to be there when I was going back home for her funeral. And I had to keep telling myself that, no, this is her funeral you're going to. Now in his 30s and living in North Carolina, support. Trevin is finally able to bring himself to talk about his sister's death. Definitely the most difficult day I've ever went through. And I do think about this. Um, I don't want to think about this stuff, but I think about Alicia, the way she loved Jeremiah, the way she was so protective, so doting over her son. And to me, obviously, it's horrendous what Jeremiah had to witness that night, but it's also horrendous to think that as Alicia was being brutally murdered, she would have no knowledge that this person was going to leave Jeremiah unharmed. She was most likely terrified in her last moments that, you know, she was going to be killed and then Jeremiah was going to be left unprotected by her. That is what would be going through the head of any mother. Eugene was awarded full custody of Jeremiah and they both moved to Dallas a few months after Alicia's funeral. Apparently, um, I heard that Eugene remarried once he was in Dallas, not long after this. And, you know, in, in some ways that's sad and in some ways it's like, okay, at least, you know, Eugene had help with Jeremiah, at least Jeremiah would have had a mother figure. And after this, Alicia's family had limited contact with Jeremiah. And Alicia's father, Kevin, said, quote, Jeremiah comes in the summer for a week or two. I would love to have more time with him. That's the only memory I have of Alicia. Every time I see him, I see my daughter in him. Every time I hear something about him, I know my daughter lives on, end quote. To lose your daughter and then to have your, your grandson, like Kevin said, you know, the only thing that's left of your daughter that's flesh and blood be moved away. Alicia's family lived in Pennsylvania. Texas is not close to Pennsylvania, but at least they got to see him, you know, during the summer. And Jeremiah still got to um, keep in contact with his mother's family. And while he was with Alicia's family, you know, they, they showed Jeremiah pictures and videos of Alicia and talked about her. And so at least through them, Alicia still gets to live on, not only through Jeremiah, but in his in his mind and his heart. You keep wondering how can somebody hate somebody and be evil to that degree that they would take a life, especially in that fashion, and, and live with themselves. And I remember sitting on a bed in one of the other bedrooms and I had this, this vision of Leisha fading off into the distance. And she said, goodbye, daddy, I'll see you soon. I haven't told a lot of people that, but it was like, it was final as far as I'm concerned in terms of her being here in this earth. Jeremiah grew into a sweet and lovable boy. How could he not with Alicia as a mother? But he also grew to be incredibly cautious. And he was said to like size people up before he allowed them to come close. So obviously there's a level of distrust there. Jeremiah would watch everything, you know? He kind of just was always paying attention to everything so that he could be ready. And this obviously, I think, comes from the trauma that, that he went through. And Jeremiah didn't like a lot of activity. Loud noises startled him, you know, very common symptoms of PTSD. And at this point, we have a cold case that I believe can be warmed up if the right people hear about it. A crime like this, especially if it was committed by someone who knew Alicia, which based on the evidence, based on what the police think, I kind of am leaning in that direction, it can't remain secret forever. Maybe the murderer told someone or said something to someone that seemed off or suspicious. Maybe in the days, weeks, or months after Alicia's murder, her attacker's behavior changed in some way, including but not limited to increased alcohol or drug use, depression, a job change, a location change, calling into work a lot, not seeming right, something that might stand out to someone, especially with the information that law enforcement suspects the killer could have been an ex-partner of Eugene's. Let's say somebody knows a woman who used to date Eugene and, you know, maybe a couple weeks after, you know, Alicia was murdered, 
this woman said something negative about Alicia, like, oh, well, the good she's gone or she deserved it or I never liked her or something like that, something that would just stand out. Now, I do want to elaborate more on this, but first I want to tell you about the most interesting thing I discovered when I was looking into this case. And forgive me, but, you know, I get excited about certain things and then I want to share them with you. And I genuinely believe that you will find this to be as cool as I do. So at Mason High School in Ohio, one of the teachers, whose name is Randy Hubbard, he created a forensics course that he basically built a curriculum for based on, you know, college courses and similar things that are offered at universities. And it has become such a popular and well-received class that there's several sessions of it. There's, you know, tons of students that want to be a part of this. And it branched out into a cold case program where Randy Hubbard and his students use criminal psychology, forensics science and research to help find new leads on unsolved cases, including Alicia's case. So I tracked Randy down and I forced him to talk to me for an hour because when I found out about this, I was just absolutely blown away and like extremely jealous, you know, that my high school didn't offer a class like this. I feel like I would have found my calling so much sooner if I had been introduced to it earlier and if I had felt that it was you know, accepted and encouraged by the adults in my life. Because when I was in high school, and I mean, I'm 38, so it was quite a while ago now, but when I was in high school, being into true crime, being interested in forensics and like blood splatter and stuff, you were looked at as weird. So you didn't really feel super comfortable sharing that with other people. I just think it is absolutely amazing. And I think what Randy and his students are doing can bring real change, not only to the victims of the cases that they look into, but to their own lives. For as long as I can remember, I've said that getting new eyes on old cases can make a huge difference. And it can sometimes even mean discovering things that weren't known before. Because listen, police officers, law enforcement professionals, they do a great job, but they are trained to go through an investigation in a certain way. But after 10 or 15 years of a case going cold, with no new information or tips coming in, it is a good idea to get other eyes on the case, other eyes that have different perspectives, different lived experiences. The students in Randy's class are actually going through these cases, police reports, autopsy reports. They're speaking to um, law enforcement. They're speaking to the families of the victims, interviewing them, and they're coming up with potential theories. But going through these cases has also helped them to see the people involved as people, not just names on some true crime television show. In an interview with Fox 19, Hubbard said, quote, students are learning to speak with people with a kind heart, with warm understanding, and also being able to question them without upsetting them, end quote. So in a word, these kids are learning empathy. And that is something that some people never get the hang of, even as adults, even as like old people. So I think it's such a good idea. They're also learning communication, which is super important for high school students because so many kids in high school, they're taught math and they're taught science, but they're not taught practical things like how to communicate with people, how to interview for a job, how to balance your checkbook. So like I said, I think it's a really good idea, such a good program, such an amazing way for the students to not only learn, but maybe even help bring a new perspective to cold cases. And on top of that, Randy Hubbard and his students have also started a podcast called Cold Case MHS Monsters and Demons, where they did talk about Alicia's case and so many others. This year, the class has taken on 13 cases. They've broken up into groups, and they're each going to tackle a case, and they're even giving a presentation on these cases at their high school at the end of this month, April 28th. Randy was kind enough to offer to send me a link so that I can attend virtually, and he's also given me permission to share that link with you all so that you can also check it out if you want. And I definitely think you should check out their podcast because these kids, they could be going home and playing video games or watching Netflix, but instead, they're working hard to research these cases and present them in an organized and understandable way in the hopes of bringing new information in. And I'm in awe of that, and I have so much respect for it. Randy Hubbard recently told People Magazine, quote, We know that we're probably not going to solve a case, but we could take some of the stuff off their plate. And he's speaking about law enforcement. Because they just don't have enough time or money to do the research and reevaluate a case. Our goal eventually someday is to have police departments that have cold cases on their books for 20 years or so say, Hey, can you guys look at this and review it and tell us what you find or what you think? 
and give it back to us and we'll see if there's anything we can do about the case. We're not there yet because obviously police departments and prosecutors and staff don't want to give out too much information to high school seniors, but we're trying to prove to them that we can do a lot of the research they just don't have time for, end quote. Brilliant, really. And I wouldn't say with total confidence that Hubbard and his students can't possibly help solve a case. Stranger things have happened. We've seen people with no law enforcement experience dig deep enough and feel passionately enough about a case to break it wide open. And Randy Hubbard told me a story that proves what I've been saying forever. Once you step outside the box of law enforcement training, pieces of evidence can look different and can mean completely different things depending on who's looking at them. A retired police detective that Hubbard and his class have worked with, he was going through a case at home and he had pictures from the investigation like spread out on the table and his 15-year-old daughter walked in and she was kind of like looking at the pictures over his shoulder and she ended up seeing something and pointing something out to him that he had never noticed in that way before and it ended up being a crucial piece of evidence that helped move the case forward. So I think that this is the coolest thing. I think it's so good. And, you know, obviously I asked Randy, like, did any of the students' parents initially express reservations when finding out that their children were going to be, like, looking into crime cases? Because, you know, all parents can be sometimes very protective of their children, as they should be. No judgment. And Randy said, like, yeah, initially maybe they were a little concerned about their safety. Like, who would the students be talking to? Are they putting themselves in danger or in harm's way. But Randy said the students always use his cell phone, his own cell phone when calling people involved in the case. And they aren't really like talking to dangerous suspects, but they do spend time talking to the victim's family members and friends, which helps them humanize these victims a lot more. It helps them realize that these were people with full lives, hobbies, hopes, dreams. And you know me, I love that context. I live for that context. The more three-dimensional a person is, the better. Because I've always wanted to make it clear that the individuals we speak about are more than what happened to them. They could have been your sister or your daughter or your mother, your brother, your father, your son. And it's important to always realize this. And it even makes you more conscious of the people in your life, how important they are, how grateful you are that they are alive and well and with you still. Now, I have linked some articles discussing Randy Hubbard and his class. I've also linked to their podcast. Check it out. Support them and what they're doing because I think it's amazing. And I will also link their presentation that's happening at the end of this month. Once I have that link, I'll put it in the description box of this video. I'll share it on my community page as well and on social media. So keep an eye out for that. But now I want to discuss my thoughts about what could have happened to Alicia, who could have done it. And when I was going over this case, I felt that there were a few different possibilities, with two sticking out to me more than others. Now, it's pretty clear that the police on this case do not believe that Alicia was murdered in some random burglary, even though Columbus, Ohio is a city where violent crime is on the rise, and it has been for some time. But Alicia's murder just didn't have those hallmarks. A random burglar isn't going to have that amount of anger towards the person he's robbing and killing. He's just going to want to kill them to get them out of his way so that he can rob the apartment. But Alicia was attacked with with passion. It was personal. And remember, Alicia's purse wasn't taken. Her wallet wasn't taken. Just the electronics, the laptops and the phone. It seemed that Alicia did let her attacker in and felt comfortable enough with this person to turn her back on them while they were inside. There was no sign of forced entry, no sign of a struggle, and like I said, no sign that anything was taken besides the laptops and Alicia's cell phone. And nothing was broken. There was like a fish tank by the door. There was a lamp. Nothing was broken um, like you'd see if somebody's rummaging through things trying to find valuables. Now, that being said, when I had initially heard that the electronics had been taken, I wondered if Alicia's murder had anything to do with her job as a research associate. You know, it makes sense that if she'd gotten into something she shouldn't have or discovered something that someone wanted kept secret, those things would be taken after she was dead and they would be on her computers where she did her work. But as I got deeper into the case and I found out more about Alicia's personal relationships, my opinion began to change. And when I talked to Randy Hubbard, who has seen uh, some of the police reports and the autopsy reports via a FOIA request, this was basically confirmed for me. Randy thinks the police believe that the phone and computers were taken to make it look like a robbery. But so many other things that would normally be missing during a robbery, like Alicia's purse, were untouched. 
And as I mentioned, it seems the police believe that the person who took Alicia's life was someone from her fiancé Eugene's past. So let's explore that theory a little bit, keeping in mind that no one has been named as a suspect. I'm not saying that anybody's guilty. I'm not saying that this is absolutely what happened. This is a theory. This is alleged. But if I was going to look at this from the perspective of someone who understands relationships, how complicated they can get, how high emotions can run, here's what I'm seeing. So Alicia and Eugene are together. They're happy. Their families are happy. She gets pregnant. They're planning on getting married. Everything's going great. But then Alicia finds out that at some point while they were together, even while she was pregnant most likely, Eugene was involved with another woman, and that woman is also pregnant and giving birth to her child just a few months after Alicia's son Jeremiah is born. Now, at first, Alicia's going to feel extremely hurt and betrayed, as I know I would, as I think anybody would. And as her father Kevin said, she was. But remember who Alicia was. Two of the most important things to her were faith and family, and she would have grown up being taught to offer forgiveness to people, even to those people who have done you a great deal of hurt or harm. It is very likely that Alicia would have known she could not go forward with hate, anger, or resentment in her heart. And the only way to stay with Eugene and move on with her life and with her little new family was to forgive. She would have not only felt that she had to forgive Eugene, but also the woman that he'd been having a relationship with. To me, Alicia seemed like the type of person who would have looked at Eugene's child with this other woman as the brother or sister to her son, Jeremiah, which that child would have been Jeremiah's sibling, making that child and even that child's mother family of sorts to Jeremiah and by proxy to herself. Alicia would not have wanted to move forward at odds with this other woman. She didn't seem like the type to talk shit about, you know, her boyfriend's exes on social media or even to prevent Eugene from seeing his other child. Alicia wanted to see everyone rise up, everyone succeed. She was not the type to hold anyone back or want to see their life made worse because of her presence in it. So I think Alicia would have welcomed this other woman and her child into their family with open arms. It would have been hard. It would have even been awkward at times, but Alicia did everything with an open heart and an open mind, and she probably would have felt that in the end, this would have been what was best for everyone involved, especially for Jeremiah and this other child who are innocent in this. They didn't choose this. They didn't tell Eugene to get two women pregnant. You know, these kids are innocent. They just want to be loved and they want to love. And I mean, I do have some experience with this in my own family. It's private, so I'm not going to go too deep, but I have experience with this where the cu a couple's married. Um, they have like a long marriage, they have children together, and then one person cheats, and then maybe even leaves and goes to be with another person. And then they all are like, well, we all have children together, we all care about each other, we all want to, you know, make sure that the kids in the family don't pay for our sins. So we're going to be copacetic, we're going to get along, and we're going to show that like, you can overcome anything with love. So it's likely that maybe Alicia would have felt comfortable around this woman. Maybe she would have even felt friendly towards her and thought that this woman felt friendly back. But then Eugene got a job in Dallas, Texas, and he was planning on moving there with his family, his first family, right? And that included Alicia and Jeremiah and maybe not the other woman and her child, you know, because that would be a little much. That would be going a little far. If you move to a different state with the woman you're married to or about to get married to and your child, and then you bring along the woman you got pregnant while you were engaged to another woman and her child, it's becoming more like a big love situation and less like we're just friends and we're trying to make this work situation. But as much as Alicia was a mama bear when it came to little Juju, I'm sure this other woman would have been incredibly vexed if there was even a sign that her child was being pushed to the side. She would have also felt protective towards her child and her child's status in Eugene's life. Maybe this woman would have even seen Alicia as the thing that was preventing Eugene from committing himself fully to her and his second child. Alicia was brutally murdered, but Jeremiah was not harmed. Jeremiah was not the problem. Alicia was the problem. Because while she was alive, Eugene could never be as close to this other woman and her child as he was to Alicia and Jeremiah. And now they were trying to leave Ohio and move to Texas, leaving this other woman and her child behind as if they were just baggage that could be left at like a train station left in the past. 
If Alicia had allowed this woman into her life, into her home at previous times, that woman visiting her that night would not have been a shock, and Alicia would not have viewed it as a threat, especially if, as Alicia's brother suggested, her killer held anger and hate towards Alicia and resentment, but had kept those feelings secret. Now, at this point, I don't know where the case stands. I have reached out to the Columbus Police Department because I have a few questions. My questions are, number one, has the evidence that was found at the crime scene been retested since new DNA technology has improved so much over the last decade? If the evidence has not been retested, why? Is it a matter of resources? Because that can easily be solved. You know, I've always said it's better to be facing the problem of a lack of money rather than a lack of evidence because money can always be made and raised. You can't just create evidence out of thin air. I also wanted to know, though, if Alicia's cell phone records and email records were searched through to see if she'd been having any intense communications, to see if anyone had texted her that night, to maybe tell her they were stopping by, etc., I was also curious how we know that the last text Alicia sent her mother that evening was actually from Alicia and not from her killer. This would change the timeline a bit. Allegedly, the response that Alicia had given to her mother was very short and simple compared to how she would usually sound via text. But maybe her hands were full with getting dinner prepared. You know, these are my questions. And if I ever hear back from the police, I will update you. But now it's time for us to do what we do. Talk about Alicia. Share this video. Share articles about her. Get the word out as fast and as far as you can because there might be someone out there who knows something but just hasn't put two and two together yet. Alicia's family have created a scholarship in her name, and it's awarded to one or two students from her high school every year, depending on how much money they raise. So check that out as well. Send your thoughts and your love out to Jeremiah wherever he is as he grows and goes through the difficulties that life poses, sadly, missing that positive and loving force that his amazing mother would have offered him every single day of her life. And most importantly, and I know this is hard sometimes, try and go through life like Alicia did, and like she would have continued to do, with an open heart, with an open mind, with the idea that we're here on this earth to make each other's lives better not worse, to offer support to our friends, our family, our communities, to lift others up, to instill the confidence and love into each person that we encounter, because they're going to need that to face every obstacle that life has with courage and fearlessness. Until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Straight down in that river runs deep. The mountains get steep and the voices getting too loud. All these feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery. They're going back from the grave, calling out my name. Better say I have Mary. Well, you don't know how deep it goes until it's getting you slowly. And so you got to let it go. I got blood, blood on the strings